Thank you, Dana. Thank you for helping in our worship today. I always appreciate your ministry with us. It, it really seems like it is a, it's a ministry with you. It's coming from your heart. So, thank you. Thank you. Before I read this passage today, uh, I want to make sure that we see this in the wider context of the book of Acts. We are in Acts chapter 16. This is the story about Lydia. Uh, This is an important story in the whole flow of the book of Acts because uh, Jesus has said back in Acts 1.8, you will receive the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And relative to Israel, we pretty much are at the ends of the earth. We're pretty far from there. But this, the book of Acts tells the story of how in the first century, how that happened. And just about every time you turn the page for the first 20 chapters or so, the gospel is going somewhere new to a new town, to a new group of people. Uh, there's a, there are cultural differences and just a wider and wider and wider area. And when we get here to Acts chapter 16, there's a huge bridge that will be crossed. And we'll, we'll see that, and whether not literally a bridge, they had to go across, they had to sail across the Aegean Sea. But culturally, there's a huge bridge being crossed here, and we'll get to that. But this is today's story, and this is, uh, we pick this up in Acts chapter 16, verse 11. And at this point, Luke, who is the writer of Acts, is telling the, uh, the story about his travels with the Apostle Paul. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Somathrace, and the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi. Or if you're from West Virginia, I know there's an alternate pronunciation for that. Philippi, is that right? <laughs> anyway, uh, they went to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this uh, short story about Lydia, but we thank you that it it does tell us a lot as we look into this. We ask you that you would reveal things to us uh, about her and about how people respond to the gospel and finally how we should respond to the gospel and to what you want to do in our lives. You have started something, Lord. We ask that you would continue that and, and just keep on working on that in our lives until the day of Christ Jesus. Use this time. uh, Open our hearts and minds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, there are only a few verses here that say anything about Lydia. She shows up again at the end of Acts chapter 16, verse 40. uh, but, But even though there are just a few verses here, they do say quite a bit about her. First of all, we know that she lived in Philippi. Obviously, that's where Paul is right here at the, at the moment, and she is in Philippi. Philippi, it says here, was a Roman colony, which means that the, the, the headquarters, basically, the capital city of Rome, had established an outpost there in Philippi. If I say Philippi this morning, it's because I've been thinking about this all week and trying not to say Philippi, but I know it's going to slip out. But anyway, they're they're in Philippi, Roman colony. What was typical in the Roman colonies is that there would be uh, a larger percentage of the people in that city would be Roman citizens as compared to the next town down the road. Uh, There would be a lot of Roman or ex-Roman soldiers who lived there. Uh, Part of their responsibility as Roman soldiers, uh, they would they would a lot of them would gain Roman citizenship but they would still be accountable even after they left 
the army or whatever, and they would be told, okay, you go live in Philippi, you go live in this city, you go live in that town. So they would be, be there as the Roman citizens, uh, spreading really the gospel of what it meant to be a Roman citizen in that foreign land. In a similar way, God has appointed you as a citizen of heaven to live in a foreign land. But that was those guys, this is not quite Lydia yet. She is not in the kingdom of God quite yet. But really the most important thing to know about Philippi it was, it was, is that it was in the continent of Europe. All the way from Acts chapter 1 through Acts chapter 15, we see that uh, Jesus is there first and then he ascends into heaven and then the disciples and then the people who were following the disciples uh, they were all living in first Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria. They were ministering there. And all the way up through Acts 15, the gospel has been in what we would call the Mideast now would be the term for it. But here in Acts chapter 16, the gospel is in Europe all of a sudden. What has happened is that if you look at Acts 16.1, uh, Paul is in a place called Derby, and this is where this is back in uh, a region that we might be Turkey today uh, on our maps. But they find Timothy there, uh, Timothy who goes on to be a follower of, of Paul. Well, verse six, uh, Paul and his companions are traveling around a little bit through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, more Turkey, uh, a lot of small towns there that he was preaching in. And then they come in verse 7 to a particular place, uh, border of Mysia, and you can look in your maps to see where that is, uh, maybe the back of your Bible, or maybe on your phone, whatever. Uh, and they tried to enter a place, Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not let them go there. So they went, passed by there and went down to Troas. What God is doing here, Paul, God is leading Paul, and he's, he's closing doors. He's even closing windows here. He says, you're not allowed to go here, you're not allowed to go there. And then what happens is during the night, Paul has a vision of a man of Macedonia, Greece, Europe, standing there begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So far you guys have just been in the Mideast. Come over to Macedonia and help us out. And then after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave from Macedonia, uh, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel there. So now they're in Philippi, Philippi. Now they're over there. And that's where Lydia is. Even though Lydia was from Thyatira. We know that later on in the first century history of the church, there was a church established back in Thyatira, which is, that's where Paul had been. That's where he had been not wandering, but he had been traveling place to place in that region over there in what is Turkey now. Uh, there was a church in Thyatira, we know, because in Revelation chapter 2, chapter 2 and 3, there are seven letters to seven different churches in Thyatira is one of them. We don't know if Lydia ever had any association, any relationship with that church, whether did she move back there, uh, she was from there. We have no idea what the connection is, but there was a church in Thyatira. Important to know about Thyatira is that Thyatira was famous for making purple cloth, which she is a seller of this purple cloth. She's making, or they make the product back in Thyatira, and she is selling it. Uh, now, it's not so unusual to sell a product in that day, to take it from one place and, and sell it around. But what was unusual about her was that apparently she was a single woman. Whether she had been uh, widowed and she was carrying on the business that her husband had started, we, we don't know that. Uh, she may have been just a single woman, never married. Uh, it could be that she is, her family has the business in Thyatira and she's kind of the agent there in Philippi, uh, which was uh, a probably a town of some wealth because of all the Roman citizens and the connections with the, the city of Rome. So she's there uh, from Thyatira, probably single, and she's selling the purple cloth. 
uh, Thyatira did. Uh, they produced this cloth, which was a very high quality. Compared to others, it is said that it was a very good product. It was a good dye that would really get into the fabric of whatever they were, they were, they were dyeing. And uh, it was very expensive. Kings and queens would wear this purple cloth. The rich people would get as much of this as possible to show everyone their wealth and their status and how important they were. Jesus wore a purple cloth at one point in his life. Before he went to the cross, the Roman soldiers put a purple cloth on him. And I'm sure they meant it to mock him, but in reality, he was the king of kings. He was the Lord of lords. He was better than any of of us, higher than any of us. But Jesus even wore this. She was probably a wealthy woman. And we say that because of the business that she was in. She was selling a product that the wealthy people wanted a lot of, as much as they could get. So it was probably expensive, and she probably made a lot of money from this. But she's also described as being the leader of a household, which was not everybody had a house full of servants and uh, maids and cooks and, and butlers. Uh, and in fact, how many of you, the maid, burnt your eggs this morning? Nobody. So the maid, all, maid did a good job in your house this morning. But she had a household of people. But also, her home was large enough. Well, let's see, a little bit later on, she invites Paul and Silas, who is with him, and Luke, who is the writer of this, is with Paul at this point, and there may be, there's probably other people in this traveling party. Her home, her house, is big enough that she has extra rooms. They can stay there for really as long as they want. Uh, She just invites them over to the house. What we need to see also about her, that she was a worshiper of God. This is a very specific term in the book of Acts. And it shows, or it's also used uh, in Acts chapter 10, verse 2, to describe Cornelius. Uh, In Acts chapter 17, verse 4, uh, it describes a group of of devout people, God-fearing Greeks. What this term meant was that she was a Gentile by her birth. That she had been raised probably to believe in hundreds of gods. Because the Romans and the Greeks and those people had a a different god for, I mean, think back to elementary school or high school, whatever, when you learned about the Roman mythology, if you learned that at all. Uh, There were a lot of gods for a lot of different purposes, reasons and whatnot. She had traded that. She'd gotten rid of that. And now she was a God-fearing woman. She wasn't a Christian yet. But somehow, it had been revealed to her, someone had told her, she had figured this out for herself, that there was one God, and the one God that was worthy of being worshipped, the one God above all others, was the God of the Hebrews. And so, she was a follower of the Hebrew traditions. Even though she may not have been Jewish herself, she was practicing all the things that the Jews would have done. Part of her new life as in living the Jewish way would be every Sabbath she would meet with the other people of the town who had a similar philosophy, a similar belief, and they would meet down at the river. Now, it's kind of interesting that this is a group of women, that Paul meets these women down by the river, there's apparently, apparently there are not enough men in this community. There are not enough Jewish men here to form a synagogue. You needed a certain number, you needed 10 reliable, faithful Jewish men in order to have a synagogue. But here she is meeting with other women. So it must have been a fairly small community, but she was very prominent in this community, apparently. But one day when she's meeting with them, The Apostle Paul Paul comes by, and the Lord opened her heart. The Lord opened her heart. 
for Lydia, this was probably the first time that she ever heard anybody talk about Jesus. She knew the, the one God, the one God above all others. And she'd already made big changes in her life in order to, to follow the, the Hebrew God. But now when she hears the message of Jesus, this means something to her. And God opens her heart. The way Luke writes this, it's like literally opening. Like you would open a can or open an envelope or open anything. God just took her heart and just cracked it right open. What a beautiful way to write about what God does in a person's heart. I would encourage you, if you want to pray for someone who does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, use those words or something like that. You know, God just, get in there and open that person's heart. Break that hard shell that's on them. Open that. And also, it's what we need for ourselves, those who claim to follow Jesus. We need open hearts. We need open minds. We need and just a sense of openness to God. And God is the one who does that. Now, how does she respond to God? Here's how. In general, we say that she was the very first convert in Europe, she was the very first convert in Philippi, actually. But she was uh, the first one. When we get to heaven, and I don't know if there's going to be statues of, oh, this person, this was this event, or I don't know what it's going to be. But Lydia will be honored forever and ever and ever as the first person living in Europe to come to faith in Christ. Pretty outstanding to have that on your resume for all eternity. That's really a nice thing. But also there's something about Lydia in that, in that in the New Testament, there are many stories of the gospel going to a place, and people believe, and uh, people turn their hearts over to the Lord. She is the only woman, there are other women, plenty of other women who are in the New Testament, but this is the only place we see in the book of Acts or anywhere else where the first person, the most prominent person, is a woman. So she has, she has that going for her. It's just sort of historical trivia kind of a thing. But God just selects her. She's going to be the one to respond to the gospel. Now, specifically about her, we can say that the first thing she did when God opened her heart was that she responded. God did the opening, and then she took a step of response. Now, in the New International Version, which I read earlier, it says that she responded. That's not quite enough of a word. The Greek and other translations translate that differently. Because responded in some ways sounds like, did you ever go to the doctor and you sit on the table and he takes the, oh, I'm sorry. He takes a thing and taps your knee and then your knee jumps. That's an automatic response. There was a little bit more to it than that for her because sometimes outside the New Testament this word is used when a ship was being brought into the shore or being brought into harbor. That's, it's the same word that God opened her up and she moved to a place of safety home with the Lord. But to bring a ship into harbor takes some care and some consideration and some thought in this process. In fact, uh, some of the other translations in the New Living, I know some people have that. It says she accepted. Uh, the message says she listened with intensity. Uh, my version would be my translation. She thought about it. She put her focus on it. She, she weighed what Paul was saying when God opened up her heart. Why does that make a difference? Because when God opens up your heart or your mind, you know, maybe there will be that instant, yes, but maybe you need to weigh it a little bit. Jesus talks about counting the cost. There are things that God will bring into your heart, into your mind, into your life, and you need to ponder 
on that for a minute. You need to pray about that for a minute. Now, eventually, you need maybe you need to respond yes to that or, or no to another issue. But when God brings you something, you need to think about that and, and, and consider that for your life. Jesus talks about building a house on the rock and not on the sand. If you're going to to do that with your life, you need to think about it. In fact, God, when God comes to you, he asks you to give your whole life. And that's, I mean, maybe there's somebody who just, yeah. But I think for most of it, most of us, we really need to consider, you know, there might be a loss somewhere if I follow Christ I might need to leave that behind and you need to figure out what that might be so when God opens your heart respond pay attention go forward think about it well the second thing she did when God opened up her heart was she was baptized immediately it says I mean there was no there was no in between here She was baptized immediately. Once she decided, she did jump in all the way. And to be baptized meant that she was identifying with this new thought, this new Jesus who was being presented to her. She was publicly saying, I follow Jesus now. I'm doing more than just believing in a God who's above everything. Jesus is the name I have for God now. He is the person who is God in my life now. now I'm, I'm not trying to mess up the Trinity or anything like that. But, but Jesus is the one for her. She's not following Paul. She's not following Silas or Luke. She's following Jesus. And baptism by immersion was the sign to others that a change, this is new for me. This is now the direction I'm going. These are the people I'm going to be with, and this is the, the God that I'm going to follow application for you generally we could say if you believe in Jesus you need to do something that shows people around you that you believe in Jesus and that you are following Jesus and the way of Jesus and not just look like everybody else I mean it's okay to to dress like people dress and, and all that but what in your life really makes you stand out as a Christian and people can say oh that person that's what a Christian looks like right there specifically we could say get baptized now for me personally I grew up in a Baptist family um, was baptized when I was 11 or 12 and it was it, it was I didn't do it because well I just everybody else is doing it I did it because I had a personal commitment to the Lord Jesus, and, and that was the expression in the Baptist church uh, of, of what it meant to follow Christ. Now, the New Testament word here is very clear that baptism for her, for this experience, and everywhere else in the New Testament was immersion. And I know there are many other kinds of baptism sprinkling or or whatever it's confusing because so many other churches have rituals that are different we we even use the same word but um, that is what this says here baptized by immersion now I've had conversations with people uh, outside the church some here in the church you know what would and people are reluctant sometimes to take that step of, of faith uh, obedience because they wonder, well, what will this person think about me? And doesn't this mean to them that I'm getting rid of something else in my past or whatever? Um, and I would say, if you feel God calling you to be baptized, then be baptized. And maybe there are issues that need to be clarified or whatever with, family, friends, whatever. Uh, but, but this is the step she took. This is a step you can take too. Okay. The third thing she does is she had her whole household baptized. Now, it could be that in that culture, the leader of a household 
made decisions that affected and directed everybody, even to things as, as big as this. There are places uh, in the world today where the gospel goes to a new place, a new village somewhere, and the, the village leaders say, yes, we're going to become Christians. And everybody in the, in the village is, they get baptized, and, and now they, as a community, are making this decision about following Christ. That could be what was going on there, but it could be also that her, her witness was so strong that she, there might have been something happening that was so powerful in her that everyone else who knew her just, oh, you know what, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, I see that in her. I'm in it too. It could be that as well. Either way, they follow her example. The fourth thing she does is she invites Paul, Silas, Luke, and whoever else is with them into her home. And this is more than just, uh, you know, now the church is over. If you want to come over for lunch, come on over. No, this is an urgency to this. This is the same word that is used back earlier in chapter, uh, in verse 16:9, is it? When uh, the vision and this, pro- this man of Macedonia is probably Luke himself. But he urges Paul to come over. Come over and preach where we are. We need the gospel. There's an urgency here. Lydia says to Paul, come to my house. I want you to be with me. I want to provide something for you. And really, it's not just lunch. It's not lunch, and then we'll watch the game, and then have dinner later. This is, come to my house, stay with me for as long as you want to. This is a completely open-ended invitation. Live in my house. And actually, there were places where Paul stayed for a year or two years. Not in Philippi, but, but this was, you know, now you're part of my family. I'm part of your family. Come and live in my house. So, immediately she is generous. What belongs to her is now available to God. Can you say the same thing about your, quote-unquote, your possessions, your things, your house, your car, your whatever it is that God has, has appointed you to be a steward over? Are you as generous as this? Well, the fifth thing she does is quite a list here. She asks them to approve of her faith and her experience. And I want to read this again here in verse 15. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. It really doesn't seem like this is uh, from an insecurity kind of a standpoint. Um, I'm not really sure if I'm a Christian. If you think I am, come over. Um, If you think I'm worthy, it doesn't seem like with all the strong things that are there in here about her, it doesn't seem like the insecurity matches up with all of that. I think this is much more in tune with the idea of in her field, the selling of purple cloth, she's an expert in that. She knows the good product from the bad product, from the imitation product, from whatever. She knows what's genuine. And she knows that Paul and Silas and and the others in that group, they are experts in conversion, experts in theology, experts in in religion for the following Christ. And she says, if you see the genuine thing in me, because I want to have the genuine thing in me, then come over to my house. She, she doesn't want, you know, just the approval of the people who are important in, in the church. She wants the approval of God. That God is saying, yes, you are genuine in this. Yes, this is, this is where you need to be with your heart and your life and the openness and everything. So I think that's what, what is going on here. And there's a difficult application here. Maybe the most difficult out of all of these. Are you willing 
to allow someone else that you trust to put you and your life under the microscope. Are you willing to go to someone else and say, someone you respect and trust, and say, do you really see Christ in me? What are the, what are the blind spots that I'm not seeing that, that are kind of obvious to everybody else, including yourself? And please tell me this in a loving way. Please still love me. But, but where are the areas that I really need to grow in and that you think that I really could grow in? That's vulnerability right there. But Lydia shows that that is something that, that she was willing to do right off. You know, if you, if you see the genuine thing in me, then that's good, and I'll move forward with that. But she was also willing, she was vulnerable in, maybe they didn't see it. Maybe they saw somewhere where she needed to really, she really needed to grow in order to be genuine. So that's, that's a tough one. We don't like to do that, but here's an example of it. Well, the last thing she does is in Luke, or Acts 16.40. Uh, there's a long story here. Paul and Silas, after they come to town and meet these women, Lydia's, Lydia's converted, and then they, Paul and Silas end up in jail. And lots of things happen here. But in chapter, verse 40, they're released from jail. And where do they go when they're released from jail? Verse 40, after Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. And then they left. Her generosity and her life change lasted more than five minutes. This was something that was permanent in here. If, in fact, in the book of Philippians, which is, that's the church in Philippi here, uh, Paul writes to them later on, and he says, I remember, one of the really good things I remember about you and your church was that you were generous to me and you supported me. In fact, after Paul and Silas leave, and they will leave really soon after this, uh, after they leave the town of Philippi and go on, Paul says, you were the only church out of all the churches that we were in that supported us, not only in your town, but as they traveled on. So generosity lasted more than the time that they were actually in the town. It lasted when Paul and Silas were over here, then they went over here and preached, and then to the next town. And apparently, wherever they were, in fact, they... They sent a person, Epaphroditus, you might know that name from the book of Philippians, they sent one of their pastors, it seems like, to the Apostle Paul with some money or clothing or food or whatever to, to help him. So generosity is, is a big deal in Philippians. And he says that their faith will always be an inspiration to him because when he preached, right away they were there. Right away they responded when God opened their heart. So final application. Will people remember you for your joy, your partnership in the gospel, for your generosity? Will they remember you as someone who accepted things and, and weighed things and moved in new directions and were open and, and vulnerable to God and to other believers around you? So let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we have this example of Lydia who uh, really stands alone in the New Testament in, in many different ways. We thank you for her uh, reception of the gospel and that she gave us a great pattern to follow in the way she, was, uh, she led other people to Christ and she was generous once she was a Christian. Uh, but Lord, we, we just thank you that, that Jesus is our greatest example that he accepted your will and did your will. And he was generous with everything, including his own life. So as we move into communion, Lord, help us to, to see you at work still calling and, and asking us to, to follow you and follow Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.